Today on Landline, the fifth generation farmers who've gone from cotton to rock melons and now onions and garlic. We stumbled on a, a variety that worked for this area. It's just a, it is just a bastard to grow, basically. Why is the sheep market in a slump? You've got oversupply, you've got the market crashing, the fear that's been created by this El Nino prediction, I've never had to deal with that one. And the station trader who sold $200 million worth of cattle properties in one year. Someone once said you can be delusionally negative or delusionally positive, and I think I'm always that delusion. Like, I'm gonna to come to the Northern Territory and sell, sell cattle stations. My first year, I think I made, I think I made $940 in commission. <laughs> Hello, I'm Pip Courtney. What do you do when a fruit you've invested millions into growing, packing and marketing is no longer profitable? For a pair of fifth generation farming brothers, the pressure was on to make the right decision. Not only to honour the work of previous generations, but to ensure a bright future for the sixth. The Moon family farm near St George, 500 kilometres west of Brisbane. And if the Moon name sounds familiar, yes, they have been on landline before. Back in 2000, worries over the uncertainty of irrigation water prompted a move out of cotton into rock melons. In the beginning, the Moons had a small shed producing up to 2,000 boxes per day. Since then, a $2 million state-of-the-art packing shed has increased production to 7,000 boxes per day. That equates to seven semi-trailer loads. Now, they've switched again. Rock melons were good to them, but the weather wasn't. We were always under the pump because of the weather. If we had a lot of sunshine one week, then we picked a whole lot of melons and we had to sell them that week. Now, they're growing onions and garlic, which, unlike melons, can be stored for months. It helped too, the family had history with onions. Dad was a fourth generation farmer from the Lockyer Valley originally and, and he had experience growing onions, so we thought we'd give them a go. Fifth generation farmers, brothers Andrew and David, complement each other. Andrew does the marketing, David's boss in the paddock. Andrew is the pessimist, David the optimist. If I'm not happy with something David's doing, I'll tell him, and vice versa. But we don't, we don't carry on, you know. We have a job to do, we're busy, we don't have time to argue. Their biggest onion customer is a major supermarket, but they also sell into the central markets and overseas. In the past, we've exported to uh, Thailand, Taiwan, um, Japan, Singapore, Hong Kong. Um, this year, we're gonna go into New Zealand. Uh, which is really, really interesting one, considering they're, they're one of our biggest competitors. We'll go wherever the market is, basically, um, and that ranges from year to year. The Moon Brothers didn't want to talk hectares or tonnage, but they grow enough onions, red, brown and white, to keep this packing shed running all year round. The harvest lasts four months for onions, and at its peak, the shed's running seven days a week. A third of their onions are red and almost two-thirds brown. And whites, well, the market's tiny, less than 1% of production. When the red or salad onion came in, whites just went out of fashion. These whites are for food service customers. Garlic is a higher value crop, but it's expensive to grow. So when a major customer asked them to grow it... We sort of basically said, no, don't be stupid at the start because we'd already trialled it and uh, we, we were pretty confident it wouldn't grow here and um, then we stumbled on a, a variety that worked for this area. It's just a, it is just a bastard to grow, basically. It is not easy to grow. It, it is our hardest crop that we have ever grown by a long shot to get it through to a 
marketable place. I reckon learning to grow garlic, we've, we've lost way more than we've earned so far. The expense is due to hand weeding and hand harvesting. Andrew estimates garlic is handled up to 20 times before it makes it to a retail shelf. The biggest deterrent to growing at scale is the seed. If we want to grow 400 tonnes of garlic, we need roughly 40 tonnes of seed. And seed is a clove? The seed is a clove. So it's a clove from last year's crop. So we have to look after that between last year's crop and this year's crop. It's, um, it comes down to how much seed you can keep, how much of a, how good of a year you've had, and it's our most expensive seed because we have to value it per kilo um, the same as we would get if we sold it. The brothers work harmoniously, except when David moved into regenerative agriculture. Andrew was less than impressed. I couldn't bloody stand it. It was, I thought it was really messy, you know, like the farm looked shocking. And we had strips of this and strips of that. And, but we're starting to see the results now. And, um, you know, I, my job is to deliver quality to our customers. We weren't doing that. And I'm happy to say now we, now we are. I got the vibe that I hope the bloody hell it works or we're really in trouble, but um, I was, no, I was always confident that it would work. This is the mess which worried Andrew five years ago. It's a multi-species, cool season cover crop, a haven for life above and in the soil. I know they're, I know our, our neighbours are interested. They, they have a different system of farming and, and I don't judge anyone. Um, I think maybe probably some of them laugh at us. I don't know. So what? Doesn't sound like you care much. I don't care. There are seven varieties in here. Grasses, triticale and barley were chosen for their fibrous root systems. There are two brassicas, oh, including the really huge great. tillage radish. Um, if I'd have watered this a lot and given it a heap of moisture, this probably would have been oh, well, easily double this size. And will that smash through any hard pans? Yeah, that'll go through hard pans and um, one of the most important things with healthy soil is to be able to use the full profile of the soil, so um, this just helps that. Two legumes, including hairy vetch, fix nitrogen in the soil and linseeds in both spring and winter mixes. This is a really important one for um, certain microbes and um, fungal activity. It's uh, really increases the diversity of the microbial population in the soil. To boost soil microbes and preserve moisture, David's using an implement which is becoming more common in Australia, a crimper. By crimping the stems in several places, plants are terminated, then rolled over to create a moisture-preserving shield. If we don't have a shield on the soil, either by living plants or plants that are terminated, we can have this effect where the top inch of your soil can be oxidised and um, that's pretty bad because it can leave a lot of your nutrients um, unusable. Carbon levels are up, plant diseases, fertiliser and insecticide use is down and the soil is healthier. We are making a difference, a very small amount at a time, but um, that small amount is a large amount to a crop. That's the thing about it. And it's made farming a challenge again. It's made it fun and, you know, we were in a bit of a bad spot at one stage. We were seeing um, problems with diseases and issues where we could see that our soil was being depleted. Buyers have started asking Andrew about the farm's carbon footprint and he says they're working on reducing it. As well as regenerative practices in paddocks, the packing shed and cold room now run on 70% solar. More panels are planned when a new value-adding building goes up to house the latest venture, dehydrated garlic, the moon's war on waste. We're dealing with a high-value product that, that at the end of the day is very hard to produce and, you know, you throw away 
100 kgs of, gar of garlic, that hurts a lot. And what else is coming down the track? Oh, it's a secret, Pip. Like we, it's, um, uh, we've got, we, we've always got something new. Garlic's an amazing product, as you know, and it, it's something that we can do a lot with. The Moons have won some big national awards, but key to their success is their Pacific Island workforce. Under the Palm Scheme, the same workers return each year for three years. We need the workers, and the workers need us just as much as we need them, and, yeah, I don't understand how you can treat another human being poorly. <laughs> they pay the same as if they were an Australian. We are heavily audited through the Palm Scheme. Uh, we have to show pay slips, we have to show deductions. Uh, they're employed under Fair Work over here, so they have the same rights as everyone else. Their housing is top notch, it gets approved as well through the scheme. After two years here, Alice bought a block of land at home in Vanuatu. It will be paid off by the end of the year. My dream is to have my own land and my own house away from my parents. Claire Nasser has nearly a year under her belt and two more to go. She told me the work isn't hard and has no complaints about housing or pay. Her onion money is paying off a house back home in Vanuatu. Have my own house, yeah. Having our own property, maybe. God's will. During the pandemic, onion sales increased by an incredible 700%. Their foreign staff who couldn't go home saved the day. Coming out of that COVID period where there was just no one to employ, if we didn't have um, the palm scheme, we would have nearly had to shut the doors. It's as simple as that. We've had guys that have gone home and fixed up all the roofs in their village and um, done all these great things. And they're all great community people and they love it. And um, we love having them because uh, they become, they become part of their families. The Moon's sixth generation is already working on farm and the brothers say the business will continue to change as markets, climate and the next generation dictate. We've got all bases covered um, and if there, if there aren't any bases covered, we're, we're looking at them. A trainee doctor from Western Queensland is holding workshops for high school students about sexual harassment and consent. He started the classes after a female friend was sexually assaulted and now more than 5,000 students in Queensland have attended his workshops. And as Landline's Helena Batchkowski discovered, Outback students aren't missing out. In a classroom in Winton, in Western Queensland, high school students file in for an extracurricular class. They're about to meet Curtis Raymond, a trainee doctor who grew up in the area. But the students aren't going to be hearing about how to be a doctor or why they should stay in school. Nope, they are learning about sexual assault, harassment and consent. I do this all over Queensland doing these talks. The first one is what we're about to talk about, the topics that we cover, are going to be really full on. They will be confronting for a lot of you and, and it may trigger some things that have happened in the past. If it's not to you, it might be someone that you love and someone that you know. So this is not a classroom. I am not a teacher. Curtis's story is unremarkable. He grew up on a cattle property just west of here. And uh, like a real bush kid, just loved it out here, but then went to boarding school fell in love with doing other things and turns out I was half good at doing studies so then I decided to do another eight years of it. So I'm um, studying medicine now in my final year, just about to graduate. With hopes to become a rural generalist specialising in obstetrics, Curtis is currently based in Townsville and Longreach hospitals. But in his spare time, he creates and delivers workshops called It's a Man's Issue. 
Winton State School has around 80 students spanning from kindergarten to grade 12. Today's workshop is for senior students, the ones who can understand the issues discussed and their complexities. I get really quite passionate and I come across as angry. If you're a young man, you'll feel quite attacked when I do this talk. You'll feel like I'm angry at you. I want you guys to remember that I'm not angry at you. I'm really angry at this problem, but I'm here to talk to you guys because you have the most potential at changing our society, at making a difference. The fullback gets chopped. So how did a rugby playing boy from the bush become so passionate about addressing rape, sexual assault, harassment and consent? I suppose it was lots of little things that happened over the years. The big moment was uh, my best friend, she was, she was raped by another guy that was sort of in our social circles. Um, and up until that point, I was doing behaviours, doing things that I never thought were part of the problem. And then, you know, this big thing happened to her and she was the first person close to me in my life that I saw go through this really terrible process and everything else that comes along with being sexually assaulted and, and saying that you've been raped. Um, and it was a real light bulb moment for me. And then I felt so angry, so, so angry by what happened to her. Um, and I couldn't channel my anger and frustration into anything. Despite his encouragement, his friend didn't report the crime. Curtis wanted to know how he could make a difference. He looked for programs he could get involved in. But I felt that none of them spoke about everything that I felt needed to be said. And rewinding back to when I was a 15-year-old boy, I wish somebody had had that conversation with me. And so that's sort of what led to me saying, stuff it, I'm just going to do my own thing, and um, made a program. And then people were silly enough to think that it was good enough to then, you know, bring me on board, and it sort of just grew from there. Starting at his university in Townsville, Curtis developed his skill set with the on-campus program at James Cook University called JCU Respect. He was brought in as a co-facilitator, speaking to university and college students. Professor Tarun Sengupta is the head of the Townsville Clinical School at James Cook University, where they are training doctors to be more socially minded. Well, really, this is his work, so he's done this in his own time. However, as I said, we are values-based. We talk about social accountability, so we think that we should not just produce doctors who are technically competent, but those who are accountable and socially responsive and able to give something to their community. And he thinks the work Curtis is doing around consent and sexual assault is timely and is cutting through. I think it's something that's there and we haven't spoken about it enough. The work of Grace Tame has drawn attention to it, but I think it's great to see young men taking this on. And Curtis is spending his own time uh, encouraging others to think about the topic, to talk about it. He's got a personal example and he, he talks from the heart. I think it's a wonderful thing. Entitled. Teacher aide JC Jack is the reason the Winton School is holding the workshop. She learned about the program through social media after seeing a colleague post Curtis presenting his workshop in Charters Towers. And she thought, this is what we need for our school. I feel strongly about the, the content of his talks and, and the movement that he's, he's got going. And I've personally been affected by it as well. So it hit me at home and I knew from talking with these kids here, I have a, a close relationship with a lot of the high school kids here and I know that it affects them as well. So I knew that this was something that we needed to bring to the kids and educate. How did you think the students would respond to this workshop? I actually thought they'd, they'd handle it really well and that, that they would be receptive to it because we've started a program where we are talking to the boys and girls separately about these different issues and we've brought it up in a way that the kids talk to us about what they want to know about and then we deliver that information to them and this is this is exactly the stuff that they want to know about more of. One of the motivating factors for developing these workshops are the startling statistics. I think the stats are horrifying and really scary and the reason why I show them and I talk to them, to the students about them is because uh, like I didn't know any of that and you know the whole it's a man's issue, the title of the workshops, the fact that 97% of convicted rapists are men is something that I didn't, didn't know. And you can see when you do the talks with the students you know they think it's 50, 60% and then when you talk about victims 
the vast majority being women, um, and you just see the numbers. If you are a young woman growing up in Australia, you have a one in three chance of being sexually assaulted before you turn 15. You are more likely to be sexually assaulted in Australia if you are a woman than you are to smoke a cigarette. When I say it's a man's issue, and when I say to schools, I really want to talk to your young men, predominantly that's my target audience, the reason is, is sexual assault, sexual harassment is a gendered based crime. The principal at Winton State School, Corey Kempthorne, is thrilled with the workshop and hoping to build on it. It was quite confronting at times, definitely, but I think he, he shared the information that, you know, that's difficult for teachers to, to talk about, um, you know, given the relationship between student and, and teacher. So, no, he, he definitely, he covered off on some topics that, um, you know, is going to, it's going to make it a lot easier in the classrooms and the day-to-day -day workings of the school. All right. You're on the man box. The students, the to their box. credit, were attentive and active during the two-hour session on a very hot day. OK. What do you think it means to be a man? Don't say you're sorry, so unapologetic, is that...? The content is heavy, but Curtis has a way of connecting with the room. Ask me if I want to kick the football. Oh, my God, yes, I want to kick the football! Woo-hoo-hoo-hoo! I've got my football boots, let's go. Kick the football right now. Keep on kicking the football. Kick it like that. Oh, my God, I'm enjoying it when you kick the football. Woo! Now, we're not talking about a football, obviously. We're talking about sex. Now, I recommend when you do start getting enthusiastic consent and you start having sex, you don't say, hey, do you want to go kick the football? They'll probably look at you and think, what the hell are you doing? And even better, the students well, we seem to get something out of it. I really want to kick the football. I learned that the percentage of women getting sexually assaulted is so high and it's really sad and it affects so many people like family members and friends and, yeah. And Reese, as a, as a young man, um, what did you learn from this? Oh, it's just useful things like asking for consent and stuff like that. It's just, I'm always going to think about that. It's going to be in the back of my head now. Like, always keep that in mind. And, yeah, you learn a lot more stuff like that. I didn't really, like, know. I learned so much today just from sitting there and, like, listening and paying attention to mm. and, like, all the stats and stuff as well, yeah. Banjo, coming into this, did you know what what you were, you know, getting into? No, to be honest, I actually didn't really want to come to it. I just thought it was kind of stupid, but to be honest, when I'm, like, going over all this stuff, like, it made me realise, like, like, what girls actually have to go through. Like, it's kind of, like, sad once you think about it. Like, all us men, like, we can go out and just have fun and girls can go out and have fun, but there's always that chance that something might happen and that percentage is, like, real high, so it's, like, like, pretty high, I'm sorry. Yeah, I think it's good because it's a bit harsh for girls. And at least they'll know that if a girl's drunk and you're at a party, then they say no, that it's not, it's consent. Like, you, you can't keep going or anything like that. Did anything shock you? Um, yeah, probably the percentages and all that. But there are some forms of masculinity that are toxic, that are bad. This won't be the end of these students' education on difficult topics like this. The school, like many around the country, follow guidelines to encourage supportive and respectful behaviour. At Winton State School, we have embedded restorative practice as part of our behaviour management process. And what restorative practice begs for is really deeply relational approach with our students. And it also calls for a really open and caring kind of relationship as well. So through that, you know, we're able to continue these topics and, and really open up that, um, that thread of conversation with our kids. <laughs> it's really good. Thanks, guys. Uh, see you later, hey? Love you heaps. No worries. Thank you so much. Curtis has presented his It's a Man's Issue workshop to more than 5,000 students in Queensland's north and west, and he has presented in Brisbane and the Sunshine Coast. He has big plans for the future. When I first started, I just said, you know, I want to talk to every student in Townsville because that's kind of my area. And then every year it's been like, oh, now I want to talk to every kid in Queensland. And now it's, I want to talk to every, you know, every kid in Australia. I think it's something that really needs to be spoken about.
And for his work, Curtis Raymond is one of four nominees for the Young Australian of the Year in Queensland. And if you need to speak to someone after seeing that story, you can call 1800 RESPECT. Still to come on Landline, the remarkable journey of an Outback real estate agent. I had a tumour in my spinal cord and I had a whole year of learning how to walk again, basically. But I'm a lucky person. Hi, I'm Kath Sullivan. Irrigators have volunteered to sell the federal government entitlements to almost twice the volume of water it was seeking to purchase from six valleys across the Murray-Darling Basin. The government opened the tender for more than 40 gigalitres of what's known as bridging the gap water earlier this year, after an undisclosed sum was set aside in the federal budget. The government is also attempting to amend legislation so it could purchase up to 450 gigalitres of additional irrigation water to allocate to the environment. The legislation would also extend the deadline for water saving projects and is due before the Senate by the end of the year. But not everyone's convinced by the proposed changes. We need greater security uh, for environmental flows in the Murray and in the Darling Barker system. We also need to see at long last justice delivered to First Nations whose water has been taken without their consent whose country has been decimated. Obviously it's going to impact significantly on our prices, which will go to the consumer and frankly could put our business as well as the farmer's business that we buy from at risk. This will just add to our disadvantage in terms of competing against cheap importers coming from everywhere from China to Italy to everywhere else. A new report from the Productivity Commission has found if the government's proposed changes are adopted, it won't be enough to implement the plan in full, and it says existing funding is insufficient. The Commission said any further voluntary water buybacks should be undertaken gradually so as not to create rapid disruption to communities and the water market. A massive trade deal with the European Union appears all but doomed after so-called endgame talks between Australia and the EU dramatically fell apart. Trade Minister Don Farrell had planned to finalise the agreement when he met the EU Trade Commissioner on the sidelines of a summit in Japan. But before the two sides even had the chance to sit down, Senator Farrell told his EU counterpart that the offer on market access wasn't good enough. Throughout these negotiations, we have unfortunately been unable to get the EU to increase its offer, particularly on things like beef, sheep, dairy and, and uh, sugar uh, exports from Australia. Uh, we keep going back into negotiations, being told by them that they're prepared to consider a higher offer, and they keep on offering basically the same thing as what they offered months ago. The ABC understands an agreement had been reached on the thorny issue of naming rights that would have allowed Australian producers to continue using names like Prosecco and Parmesan with some adjustments. The New South Wales government is defending its decision to lift a two-decade-old ban on the aerial shooting of Brumbies in Kosciuszko National Park. It says aerial shooting is needed to protect the fragile alpine ecosystem and reduce feral horse numbers from 18,000 to 3,000 over the next four years. We've kicked this down the road for too long and that's why the number of horses is too large. The state government is finalising a new count of feral horses in the park, which is expected to be made public in coming weeks. And finally, a rust-coloured Kelpie named Earl has taken out top dog honours in a competition that tracks dogs' distance and speed over three weeks. A GPS tracker on Earl's collar has shown him running faster and longer than other working dogs. The Tasmanian pup clocked more than 1,300 kilometres over 21 days to take out the competition. Blind in one eye, he's got quite a nice scar across one of his eyes, but yeah, he's, uh, he does pretty well. It doesn't seem to hinder him at all. And that's Landline News. In just two years, sheep and lamb prices have soared to record highs and plunged to lows not seen since 2007. 
this turnaround in conditions and fortunes is forcing producers to make some tough decisions. National Rural Reporter Kath Sullivan looks at some of the reasons behind the tanking market and what can be done to help the world's biggest sheep meat exporter out of this slump. Seeking a fresh feed, this mob's heading to a new paddock. It may look all right, especially when you're looking out into the background of the film, but um, we're in a 650 mil rainfall area and we've had 300 mils. In the central west of New South Wales, Nigel Kerrin's been adjusting to the dry. Our destock started in March and we've been destocking and our last load of animals went out uh, yesterday morning and that's it for us now. We're down to where we want to be as far as um, breeding numbers go. It's not just the weather that this sheep breeder and cattle trader must contend with. It's a culmination of a perfect storm, what's going on at the moment. You've got oversupply, you've got the market crashing, you've got low labour in processing plants and interest bills that have grown. The interest bills weren't a problem until the market collapsed. The other big one is the fear that's been created by this El Nino prediction I've never had to deal with that one. He's not alone. Australia's sheep industry is in trouble. It's a crazy how it's just turned up where we've, most business has expanded in the last, you know, seven or eight years. We were, all our budgets told us to go like hell, great idea, grow your business. But now it's turned around with a commodity now that's only worth 30% of what it was it's making it very, very tight to meet those uh, financial commitments in businesses. Australian sheep and mutton prices have plummeted this year. Average price indicators have fallen by as much as 80%. It's been a steep learning curve for Tanner Morris, who's completing a uni placement at the Cairns Paul Marino Stud. I'm just starting off my career in ag and it's pretty mind-blowing how quickly things can change with even just six months. I think it is uncertain, I think is the word. Um, people are not so sure what they should be doing with stock, especially with prices wise. Yeah, I think the word is uncertain. Right at the moment, there's not a lot of ways to run. And this is the third downturn I've seen in sheep and cattle. And every time you look back at it, it was really bloody ugly whilst you're in it. And if it happened to coincide with drought, then that made it even worse. And for me, it's just, here we go again. In the sale yards, the story's no better. Yeah, it's pretty tough, you know, but there's no doubt about that. Uh, there's, there's probably no real need to sugarcoat it, it is what it is. 322 in the lead of the Merino weather. Stock agent Martin Simmons has been working out of Dubbo for the best part of three decades. After a run of strong seasons and record high prices, he says this year the market dropped further than anyone anticipated. We're coming off such record highs, and that's probably been the, the toughest pill to swallow. In 2021, at the market's peak, national lamb prices were pushing $10 a kilo. Now, you're very fortunate if you're $4 a kilo, and a lot of lambs are probably making $3 a kilo. So um, when you start to work it out like that, it's a significant drop. Chad, I got 11, 12, $12 bid. I noticed one pen there today, $15 a lamb. And to be honest with you, today it's actually a little bit brighter. So uh, you go on last week's market and they could have made $5. To go to the last in the current market, climate, we'll take whatever improvement we can get. They'll head back into a paddock to fatten before meat processing. Since the drought broke in 2020, the number of sheep farmed for meat and wool has grown 23% to 79 million, creating Australia's largest flock in more than 15 years. As pastures dry out and drier times are forecast, more sheep are being sent to market. Everyone had fully destocked by the end of 19 because we had experienced a three year drought around here. So everyone sort of went hammer and tong, um, that they had plenty of feed about them, so they bought in a heap of numbers. And now obviously um, the demand is not there for them, yet they've still got to do something with them. So it's purely supply and demand, and our game's never been any different. 
Martin Simmons worries that without rain, farmers could be forced to make difficult decisions. Fortunately, so at the minute, we haven't got to a point of destroying on farm, which is good. Uh, are we going to get there? Look, if there's not an improvement in the season, probably, you know, and again, unfortunately, that's just been realistic. But um, it, it's, it's a, a scenario we have been faced with in the past, even in my time, I can recall in the early 90s, um, I'm born and born and bred, you know, we shot all our sheep in the early 90s so that they didn't have a value. So, um, look, are we far from there? Probably not, unfortunately. There's about 33,000 sheep farmers in Australia and it's difficult to know how many are killing stock on their farms. Nobody keeps data about these things, but industry groups say they're hearing from farmers who say the prices are so low they feel they've no option but to shoot their sheep. Boys, good boys, right, are we ready to go? But there is an issue with people with a lot of sheep on their farm and there's nowhere to sell them. Our markets have got very inflexible. Lucy Anderton is a farmer and agricultural economist from WA's Great Southern Region. This year, she's contemplating something she's never done before. Yeah, we possibly won't make a proportion of our ewes as a way of reducing our numbers, um, but because we can't actually sell those ewes, you know, like, because if we did, you know, like, we wouldn't get much price for them. So we, we're just looking at our options. She says the market to supply stock to the East Coast has fallen away and there are too many animals hitting the supply chain all at once. So the supply chain just really hasn't been... Um, as efficient as it could be, I suppose, and so which is disappointing because it's not market driven. It's actually a supply chain issue more than anything. We rely on the live sheep trade to create competition in the marketplace. And that's, that's where New South Wales and Victoria have a lot more competition in the marketplace than we do. And that's a big difference. Since 2019, Australia hasn't exported live sheep to the Middle East during the hot northern summer months condensing the trade into a shorter window. Then there's the federal government's promise to ban all live sheep exports by sea, a trade which operates entirely from Western Australia. No date's been set for the end of the trade, but with confidence already low, some farmers say they're no longer inclined to invest in an industry that doesn't have a future. Obviously, that's going to create some uncertainty in the market and farmers are going to be unlikely to want to invest in that market when it's not going to exist in, in, you know, in however many years. The government's commodity forecaster recently told a Senate committee the impending ban hasn't contributed to the current downturn. Now, our assessment would be that's not the case. Like, there's clearly, you know, the underlying drivers in these markets are related to climate, supply, the rebuilding of the national herd and flock. Um, we're seeing the same impact on prices in the east as we are in the west. Mm. Um, we've seen still a number of the, the live export avenue is still open. We're seeing producers still access that avenue as a way to turn off animals. In September this year, national mutton prices reached their weakest point since 2007. For trade lambs, it was the lowest point since 2014. There have been some gains, but with the flush of spring lambs coming into the market, there's no doubt the pressure is on. Supply has been the number one driver in every region and at a national level. That just the increase in supply has been what's driving uh, mutton and lamb prices. Analyst Steve Bignall expects up to 23 million lambs will be slaughtered in Australia this year, producing a record amount of meat. We do know processors are working as hard as they can. We know that they're moving to Saturday shifts and double shifts where they can. And processors will process the animals provided they have the supply and it makes economical sense. Low prices at the farm gate are helping consumers at the checkout. In September, retail lamb prices had dropped 9.5%. The cheaper it is in the shop, the more Australians tend to eat. And lamb consumption is up about 14% on last year. Shanks alone, up 200%. Those figures are likely to grow. Price flow from sale yard prices through to retail takes about eight months for both cattle and for, for sheep. With up to 70% of the lamb produced in Australia sold overseas, international customers will be key to boosting farmer returns. But already some countries are reporting stockpiles of meat. Well, we're processing records number of sheep at present, but we're going into markets that's full. 
and you know we've got to wind ourselves out of that. Now I can understand that on our side, um, we're not paying enough money, but the consumer's not paying it on the other end, around the world. And um, you know we got the product we're processing is completely different to the store market, which the farmer takes home and grows them into animal. Having started out as a drover more than 50 years ago, Roger Fletcher and his family have built one of Australia's largest sheep and lamb producing, processing and exporting businesses, now selling into about 80 international markets. We have our wheat farms, cotton farms, sheep farms, feedlots. We process the animals through the plants. We've got our transport system to the ports and we export directly all over the world. So it's a, a long chain and never all of them runs perfect. How are they going? What's happening in the sheep market now, he says, is different. I've never seen it in my lifetime of so many things unfortunately going wrong together. You know, we had interest rates going up, power, electricity costs going up, and all these things sort of hit coincide. While more sheep need processing, the meatworks can't get enough labour. The global economy is in a funk and the effects of the pandemic are still being felt. COVID caused a huge debacle within the shipping industry and um, stuff got locked up at ports, couldn't get off. Um, products were taking four months to get to, to their destination. The customers were begging for it because the proceeds were subsidised in those countries. And then when the subsidies went off, shipping improved. All of a sudden, there was a huge amount of products landed in these countries and it's just slowed everything down. We went backwards at a huge rate. Those sheep and lambs now are built up and um, we, we got a, a recession around the world, which is trying to buy less product and we're trying to serve more product into there. Our kills last year were down probably 25 to 30 per cent for beef and sheep. And this has had a huge effect. I, I got confidence that we'll be right. Perhaps it's because the horrors of the drought are so fresh in memory. Many of the people Landline spoke to for this story have suggested the weather forecast has spooked farmers into selling stock early, adding to the oversupply. I go back to my uh, early days when um, we'd look at a ring round the moon and we'd say rain in three or four days, or we'd say, um, you know, the moon's in the right shape or the ants are, ants are working. And there was always hope there that we were going to get some rain. Today, I think the forecasters have probably done a very good job. And unfortunately, they're putting a hell of a lot of fear into people. And I mean, I'm not blaming them for being good at their job. It's, um, but it is making people very frightened. But the former drover turned global exporter is confident the industry will ride out the hard times. And there's great opportunities out there today. I mean, um, in all the bad years when I first started and uh, put stock on the roads and um, take a punt, I always took an advantage when no one else was buying. And I think there's, there's great chances to improve our flocks, to do things forward. But um, yes, it's challenging times. Hello, I'm Kerry State at Monato in South Australia, where the products coming out of this kitchen are made from second grade fruit and veggies. And next week on Landline, we'll meet the local businesswoman turning farm waste into food. G'day, I'm Matt Brand. Let's take a look at what sheep and lamb prices did this week. Numbers were slightly down from the bumper yard ends the previous week, but prices stayed fairly the same. At Wagga, I'm told there was a big contingent of restockers snapping up lambs to put back into the paddock. There was strong restocker demand also at Narracourt and at Ballarat. Cattle prices remain low, but fairly steady over the last couple of weeks, and abattoirs have processed more than 130,000 head for the third week in a row. Now, speaking of abattoirs, here's a look at Mean Livestock Australia's over-the-hook prices for cattle. There is something missing, isn't there? 
This report has been struggling for a while, to be honest, but it's now obsolete. And the reason, according to MLA, is that meat processors have stopped publicising their grid prices. Now, abattoirs may have a good reason for doing this, but it's not a great look during a time when transparency in the meat supply chain is being questioned. The former boss of the ACCC, Professor Alan Fells, told The Country Hour this week that the time that it's taking for low livestock prices to flow onto supermarket shelves is suspicious and he thinks the supply chain needs to be investigated. The meat processing sector disagrees. So it's only 18 months ago that the same farming organisations were concerned about the viability of processing. So that same model, that same structure, those same buyers are all still operating in exactly the same way. Pointing fingers at each other gets us nowhere. All it does is help politicians ensure that they potentially are going to be able to get voted in next time. That's not what this industry is about. This is one of Australia's oldest industries and it has worked in this fashion over this time and grown all together. Pointing fingers helps nobody. Meanwhile, consumer advocacy group Choice feels there is a problem at the retail end, naming Coles and Woolworths in its annual Shonky Awards. When we look at Coles and Woolies, their, their marketing, their advertising, their signs in store, they're all dominated by these claims about bringing prices down, helping people through a cost of living crisis. But when you look at their results uh, for the last financial year, they've both banked over a billion dollars in profits. And in the case of Wool Woolworths, there was a 19% a increase in their profits at 1.62 billion. These are big numbers and they're not the sort of numbers you would see from a business that's really trying to do do the best thing by its customers and to keep prices as low as possible. Let's head to Chicago now where wheat futures eased this week. There has been reports that Russia is considering a six-month ban on Durham wheat exports in order to keep domestic pasta prices affordable. Premium wheat prices in Australia fell in most areas this week and could ease further as harvest pressure ramps up. The New South Wales harvest is picking up. Queensland is almost finished and SA's major bulk handler Viterra says it received a record amount of grain in October of over 925,000 tonnes. In the wool market this week, there were falls across all types, the EMI down by 10 cents. A surge in cotton exports from the US has played a role in lowering the futures price. And in the sugar industry, the crush is all done and dusted in the Bundaberg region. And given the prices this year, you'd think the growers will be celebrating hard. And that is the Landline Check on prices. Keep it rural. Last year, real estate agent Olivia Thompson sold hundreds of millions of dollars worth of cattle country in the top end. It's her dream job, but as Landline's Christy O'Brien discovered, it's taken grit and determination to get there. Olivia Thompson's job comes with some pretty curly criteria. Navigating bush roads with big vehicles and waterways thick with crocodiles is standard for this outback real estate agent whose specialty is selling vast properties in northern Australia. I love selling stations. It was something that I've always said, I wonder how you'd get into that and um, never really dreamed I would end up doing that. Today, she's visiting a station in the Daly region, a few hours south of Darwin, where properties can be cut off for months during the downpours of the wet season. Olivia's very familiar with the country, having grown up on various Northern Territory stations and educated by School of the Air. It was a happy and nomadic childhood. Mum and Dad are gypsies, and um, I think it made us really versatile. As a teenager, she cantered the plains of Texas in the United States as a horse cutter, working alongside some of the best in the world. The people I worked for in the States um, were, um, were, were heavily tied in with King Ranch. So I got to know, um, I got to know those people quite well. 
Um, so I work for the Welch family. Um, Buster Welch trained a lot of King Ranch's great cutting horses. And um, a lot of our great breeds today go back to Little Peppy or Mr Peppy Sand Badger and those kind of horses. Now she's in a different kind of big league. I remember when I first moved to Catherine and I sold a property for just under 1.9 million and I was ecstatic. I'd never sold anything that expensive. I mean, that was only four years ago and I just sold a property last year for, well, a couple of properties for 172 million. Hello. I'm ready to work. <laughs> Doris Vale Station is on the cards today. The 67 and a half thousand hectare property was one of the first to be established in the Northern Territory. The Harrower family is selling after 40 years. Nice. The old boy thought it was time to put the property on the market. It's been in the family for a good while. Uh, what was it, 79, I do believe he brought into Doris Vale and well, I was born and raised here. And I've had the um, good fortune of my daughter being born and spending a few years here as well. It's been a great property to the family, but I think it's, well, he agrees and we've sort of come to an agreement that it's time to get out and venture into new things. Selling a property a family have put plenty of sweat, dollars and heart into is a big responsibility. I'm sure there will be, it'll pull on the heartstrings a little when, when it, you know, when it all becomes real. When they close that gate for the last I time. think so. Yeah. Olivia being local and her knowledge of the area, obviously her parents were here as well in the Northern Territory and just invaluable really, you know. She knows exactly what we've had to put in to get to where we are and yeah, it just really does help with the whole process. Not quite tucker time, is it, gang? Yes, again, we just give them beef wiener pellets once a day. But navigating the difficult seems part of her personality. The avid horsewoman and once champion boxer's biggest challenge came in 2015 with a life-altering diagnosis. I had a tumour in my spinal cord and I had a whole year of learning how to walk again, basically. Because, yeah, you have to think about it so much. But I'm a lucky person. The grit she developed in her younger years got her through. Before my operation, they were giving me the worst case scenario. I didn't hear a word of it. And, and even my sister said when I woke up and I couldn't use my legs, she said, they, they did tell you. I was, I was just like, I, I don't care. I'm going to walk again. You can't tell me I'm not going to do that. As someone who's proved doctors and doubters wrong, Olivia's advice is simple. Someone once said you can be delusionally negative or delusionally positive, and I think I'm always that delusion. Like, I'm going to come to the Northern Territory and sell, sell cattle stations. My first year, I think I made, I think I made $940 in commission. <laughs> Although she's based in Catherine, arguably the cattle hub of the Territory, she's got more on her sales slate than just pastoral properties. Hello. Hi, Olivia. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Good to see you. <laughs> <laughs> She's also in the middle of finalising the listing of a mango farm. We're ready to press go on the campaign. We have our photos tomorrow. Yeah, um, yeah. Obviously, the photographer will be out getting photos of the trees. Olivia's made more than 500 sales from stations to roadhouses and residential properties. She started by selling houses in Cairns, but the Territory's wild ways and big personalities lured her back. There's so many characters in the North, and um, I've, I've just been privileged to, to hear so many great stories from, you know, people that I guess, um, you know, are celebrities in our world in the cattle industry, and, and, um, and you know, they're the big cattle barons, and to hear their beginnings. And, there's, and, and this is, it's such a pioneering place that, most of those stories started from humble beginnings and that's what I love about they're just gritty people. She says she can only see more demand for big properties in years to come. There's a lot of interest in the North. Um, I, I guess as, 
how many places around the world can you buy large parcels of land with large herds? And, and I think that's been really attractive. But also the development side of things, like we, we, you know, with new industries or you know, high yielding crops, there's, there's been a lot of interest in, in, in people wanting to come up and you know, grow protein and fibre. She seems the right one to get them over the line. While she's wary of the tyre kickers in this business, she's never one to judge. A millionaire dresses and speaks the same as, um, as probably a ringer. <laughs> so you can never judge a book by its cover here. And that's the show for today. From all the team, thanks for your company. Time now for the weekly weather update from the Bureau. I'll see you next week. Bye for now. Hello, Sarah from the Bureau with your weekly weather wrap for Sunday the 5th of November. The past week saw hot, dry and windy conditions bringing devastating fire impacts across many parts of Australia. However, cooler and more humid conditions prevailed across the east, with afternoon showers and storms forecast each day this week, bringing welcomed rain for many farmers and reprieve from recent rainfall deficiencies. For the remainder of Sunday, however, showers and storms for the eastern half of New South Wales and Queensland, with potential heavy falls, large hail and damaging winds. Showers and storms for WA, though with little rainfall. Storms extending across the north of the country, while a ridge of high pressure brings mild and clear conditions to the far southeast. For Monday, unstable conditions across the north, while no significant rainfall is expected with the storms out in the west. Those showers and storms move further inland for the east, with the risk of storms extending as far south as Victoria. On Tuesday, heat building across the south. Dry lightning still poses a risk out in the west. Humid conditions with hit and miss storms continuing for the east. For Wednesday, more showers and storms mainly during the afternoon for the east, including Tasmania, South Australia and the north. Dry and cool for much of southern WA. On Thursday, little change for the east and north, with more possible showers and storms extending from the northwest through western Queensland, New South Wales into Victoria. Clear and dry for much of South Australia and southern WA. Becoming warm to hot for the southeast on Friday, clear and dry for much of South Australia and southern WA, while unstable conditions with showers and storms extend from the northwest into eastern Victoria. And that's it for your weekly weather wrap. We'll see you again next time. Bye for now.